Good morning. Is the sound level okay? Yes. All right. Thank you for turning it down. I was going to be the sermon whisperer. <laughs> On April 17, 1961, a brigade of Cuban exiles landed at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. It was an attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro, and this attempt was supported by the CIA. Castro had recently taken over Cuba. Guerrilla forces were supposed to prevent reinforcements and inspire an, un an uprising among the Cuban people. Poorly planned, poorly executed, the unsuccessful effort led to 114 of the landing force being killed and more than 1,000 captured. For our purposes this morning, part of the aftermath of the unsuccessful raid is particularly interesting. In a meeting with President John F. Kennedy, Arthur Goldberg, the new Secretary of Labor, asked the President why he hadn't consulted more widely why he had taken such a narrow spectrum of advice, much of it so predictable. Kennedy said he meant no offense and that Goldberg was a good man and a friend, but he was in labor, not foreign policy. You're wrong, Goldberg replied. You're making the mistake of compartmentalizing your cabinet. There are two people in the cabinet you should have consulted on this one. Men who knew some things and who are loyal to you and your interests. Kennedy asked who, and Goldberg told him, Orville Freeman and me. Orville Freeman was the Secretary of Agriculture. Why Orville, the President asked. Because he's been a Marine, because he's made amphibious landings, and because he knows how tough they can be even under the best circumstances. And why you, the President asked. Because I was in OSS, which was the precursor of the CIA. I was in OSS during the war and I ran guerrilla operations. And I know something about guerrillas. They're terrific at certain things sabotage and intelligence, nothing like them at that, but they're no good at all in confronting regular units. Whenever we use them like that, we lose all of our people. They can do some things very well, but it's very delicate, a very limited thing. But you didn't think of that. You put me in the category of just a Secretary of Labor. We live in uncertain times. Locally, our church has been without a pastor for over 16 months. And many of us look forward to clerical leadership that can provide guidance and inspiration and comfort. And nationally, the citizens of the United States are very divided politically. We have different opinions and values and we are divided by how we view the coronavirus and the vaccines, voting rights, gun control, women's rights, judicial appointments, and the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Increasingly, writers in the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, and the New York Times are fearful these thought leaders fear that our democracy is at risk and that we should fear a political civil war. There are a variety of public opinion reports that suggest that our nation is slowly pulling apart. In a poll conducted by Republican pollster Kirsten Soltis Anderson in late January, Respondents were asked if politics is more about enacting good public policy or ensuring the survival of the country as we know it. 
51% of Trump Republicans said survival. Only 19% said policy. In a February Economist YouGov poll, Americans were asked which so statement is closest to their view. It's a big, beautiful world, mostly full of good people, and we must find a way to embrace each other and not allow ourselves to become isolated. Or, our lives are threatened by terrorists, criminals, and illegal immigrants, and our priority should be to protect ourselves. Over 75% of Biden voters chose a big, beautiful world, while two-thirds of Trump voters chose our lives are threatened. A week after the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the Capitol, nearly a quarter of the Republicans polled said violence can be acceptable to achieve political goals. Things have become so divided that people with opposing views don't just disagree, they dislike each other. They tell pollsters they wouldn't want their child to marry somebody of the opposite party. According to a CBS News poll conducted in January, more than half of the Republicans and more than 40% of the Democrats tend to think of the other party as enemies rather than political opponents. Changes in the racial and cultural makeup of the country leave conservatives, conservatives feeling far more vulnerable. Even when they think of the Republican successes in the 2020 elections, they still feel vulnerable. Some members of the U.S. House of Representatives are looking to create an America First Caucus that will seek common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions aimed at benefits for those of us who descend from Europeans. This attempt was shelved, but its leading advocate collected $3.2 million in donations in the first three months of this year. All of this is very fearful. People are starting to talk about a political civil war and fear increased violence. I have ancestors who fought as Union soldiers at Gettysburg. Peggy has an ancestor who rode with Jeb Stuart as a Confederate at Gettysburg. That civil war cost this nation 750,000 lives. To let today, no one on either side of our great political divide will benefit from bloodshed. What are we as Christians to do in the face of this gathering storm? Scripture states that we should love our enemies. I personally have struggled with this for years. During my 45 year work career, I was wronged and treated unfairly four times. In each case, my job was used as leverage against me. In each case, it took me years to get to the place where I could pray for those who had been unfair and selfish. By the way, none of these experiences happened here at SUNY Fredonia. But what are we as Christians to do? Our gospel reading this morning from Luke very directly states that we are to love our enemies. I want to suggest and to challenge you today to pray for your enemies, that we need to pray for those who would or who are working against us. This admonition is particularly difficult for those of us who have worked in politics and government. I know, it is really difficult to pray for those that you know are wrong. But I say that we must if we are to try to follow the teachings of our Lord. So I'm 
urging you to accept others, even if you don't understand them very well. We need to talk and share. We need to forgive. We need to expand the ways that we can work together. Compartmentalizing our lives and activities is not the answer. We need to trust others. We need to seek the opinion of those that we work and worship with. And we should work to be models in our community by working with those who may not be our enemies, but are far from being our friends. Henry Nouwen, the Dutch priest and spiritual leader, uses the image of mosaic artwork to provide a useful reference. A mosaic consists of thousands of little stones. Some are blue, some are green, some are yellow, some are gold. When we look closely, we can admire the beauty of each stone. But when we step back, we can see all these little stones revealing a beautiful picture. That is what our life in community is about, suggests Nowen. Each of us is like a little stone, but together we reveal the face of God in the world. So, I urge you to pray for those who have totally different beliefs and attitudes. As individuals, we must accept each other. Christ teaches us that we must pray for those who we don't like and who don't like us. We must work together. We must forgive. And as a church family, I urge that we consult widely and work cooperatively. We need to pray for this church and for all its members. We specifically need to pray for those who think differently. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Amen.
In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, you have so richly blessed us. Through the beauty of your creation, through the words of scripture that comfort and challenge us, through the community of this congregation and all the love that you have filled it with, we ask you to guide us, help us to be stewards of those gifts, and to better share your love, both in our community and across difference. We ask you to give us the strength the fortitude to do your will, even when it seems to go against our nature. We ask you to be with those who are struggling, Lord, whether it is a concern that is evident or one that they carry alone. We ask you to be with those who are afraid, who are lonely, who feel unsecure in their future. We ask you to be with the hungry, we ask you to be with those who are victims of hatred. We ask you these things for all the individuals, but also for the nations and the groups that struggle to find their way. Lord, we know that some of these conflicts are complex. We don't pretend to have all of the answers, but we know that we are not called to violence or hatred in your name. We ask you to be with our medical and scientific communities. Even as we see the pandemic begin to wind down, we know that that is a function of our privilege, Lord, and there are so many who are still awaiting aid and don't have much hope to find it in the immediate future. We ask you to help us do your work in the world, no matter how complex it may be. We pray for the leaders, both here and across the globe, that they may do the work of your people instead of the work of their own self-interest. We ask you to guide our community as we begin to vaccinate our own children. And we ask you to help us 
Strive for a world in which all children are treated with the same love and respect. We ask you to be with this congregation and also the ones that we hold dear. Please, Lord, be with Lori Fabritis, Janet Gerkensmeyer, Gina Wade Platt, Josiah Robinette, Michelle Patterson, Dan and Hazel Crockless, Milo Willie, Judy Sumption, Carol Schrantz, David and Rena Finko, Jennifer Osborne Coy, Richard Staborski, Greg Muller, Donna Heinzman, Tim Brackett, Kim Rizko, Travis Kloss, Dick Watt, Charles Devine, Ken Shearer, Sandra McBride, Bill and Jennifer Johnston, Amy Calm, Joy Height, Dick Ackley, Rachel H., Zachary Deloniak, May Lai, Caleb Kaus, Kim Thurman, Alicia Height, Kim, and the stem cell recipient. We also lift up to you the Deposit Center for Orphans of the Church of Jesus Christ in Madagascar and the Presbyterian Education Board in Pakistan. Lord, we also take this moment in silent to lift up the needs of those who don't share them, but you know them nonetheless. Loving God, we ask all of these things knowing that you have already heard them and that you withhold nothing from us, not even your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now this is the time when we normally pass the offering plates, but as we are being mindful of social distancing, we will leave the plate up front if you feel moved to give as you are able, you can leave something as you come in or come out. But we know that these are complex times for many of us, and we all find ways to give what we can, how we can. And we want you to know that you are appreciated no matter what. With that in mind, please join me in your unison prayer of thanks. Almighty God, we give thanks for all that you provide us. We ask you to provide guidance and inspiration. Keep us focused on the blessings Christ provides and help us to walk more closely with him. Bless us through Christ, who is with you and the Holy Spirit in eternal glory. Amen. And now, encourage the faint-hearted Help the weak, repay no one evil for evil, but do good to one another. Rejoice always, pray constantly, and find reason to give thanks in all circumstances. May God the Creator watch over you. May Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, walk by your side and show you the way. And may the Holy Spirit dwell in your heart and bring you peace. Amen. Thank you.